Well, good evening, everybody. How's it going to all of you at home? Hello, Sharon. Don't get uh, don't give me any survivor spoilers for tonight. Um, hey, uh, it's wonderful to see you all today. Uh, it's been an exciting day. I was dive bombed by a vulture in one of the containers outside, and we found vulture eggs. Have you ever seen vulture eggs? Because I can take you to them and show them to you. Buzzard eggs. Yes, it was one of the most. Uh, you know, you remember that scene in Fantasia, where that thing with the big black wings? It was like that, but it but it was coming right at my face. It was amazing. Ask Adam about it later. He was there. They're, they're big. I mean, they're like uh, probably twice the size of a regular chicken egg. And they're spotted. Yeah, I ran. Heck yeah, I ran. No, I, I ran towards it. No, I got out of there as quick as I could. <laughs> I've never also never seen buzzard eggs. I kind of hope they hatch. Yes, sir. <laughs> How do they taste? <laughs> We're going to scramble them up for dinner tonight. Um, Hey, I'm really excited uh, that, that we're all here together tonight. Thank you for being here. I want to introduce you to somebody. Uh, we have a guest uh, teacher with us this evening. This is a friend of mine from my time down in Baytown Highlands area, the greater Highlands area. Uh, we, uh, today, we've been talking about uh, kind of false teachings, other gospels that, that are prevalent today. We talked about Jehovah's Witness. We talked about Mormonism. Uh, and so there actually were lots and lots in the early days of the church, there were a whole bunch of uh, like false teachings that popped up and we had to figure out like what's true and what's not true. And so uh, I'm gonna have my buddy, uh, this is Jared Lee. Uh, he's come all the way from Highlands uh, to preach for us. He's the pastor at Northside Baptist Church in Highlands, Texas. Uh, he is currently getting his PhD, what's the, what's the title? Uh, Systematic and Historical Theological Studies. There you go, right? What's the name of the, of the dissertation? Athanasius' use of prospological exegesis. Right, right? You see why I called in the big guns? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, well, yeah, some of it wasn't English, actually. <laughs> Athanasius is definitely not an English name. Um, so uh, Jared is uh, literally an expert in early church history, and uh, you think I'm a history nerd, wait until you hear this guy. Um, so I'm going to ask Jared to come on up. I'm going to turn it over to him. Take it away, bud. Awesome. Thanks, Garrett. It is a pleasure to be here with you guys. Oh, uh, good to see you. Yes. I don't think so. I hope not. It might be. I'm, you need Garrett back? Okay, well. It's always, uh, well, is it ever not? There, there you go. I, uh, it's not weird for me because I guess I live in the second, third, fourth century, so it's not weird. It may be weird for you as I, as I take, take you back, roll back the clock a little bit here. And I, didn't, I forgot Survivors on Wednesday nights, and we've been watching it, and so no, no spoils for me either. Um, I'm a big Survivor fan. Well, as we get back and we think about the very beginnings of the church, you have uh, the apostles carry out the gospel. There's a group of church uh, fathers that write right after them uh, called the Apostolic Fathers. And then right after them, we have a group of church fathers called um, the Apologists and the Heresiologists. And these two groups of people are devoted to defending the faith from attacks from outside and from attacks inside. And tonight we're going to focus on the heresiologists in particular, and, and really not even so much on the heresiologists as the heretics themselves um, from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. Um, but what we see in the, the historical context, I'll tell you on the church app, uh, I gave you more notes than anyone else has given you, is what Garrett told me. So I'm claiming that. Uh, so feel free to pull that up. You can you know, track along and keep up. There's also further reading. If you don't believe something I said, I actually gave you resources from the second, third, and fourth century of church fathers' writings. And you can go and read those and go, hey, he is actually talking about things that actually happened back then. Um, I'm not just making this up. So uh, the historical context, in the second century, third century, fourth century, several charismatic figures uh, come up from inside the church, and they are teaching a gospel that deviates from the teaching of the apostles. Um, four in particular we're going to talk about this evening. We have Marcion, we have Valentinus, which is um, a form of Gnosticism. I think y'all had a, a spiritualism, which is a type of Gnosticism. Gnosticism really goes all the way back, I think, to the first century, actually. In fact, if you read Galatians, um, oh, what's the, the verse? There towards the end. It says, beware of the false doctrine of those falsely called knowledge, is what Paul writes. It's an early Gnosticism. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Gnosticism. Uh, we're going to talk about Montanism, which is another one, and then we're going to talk about Arianism finally. Um, and there's concerns in the early church for doctrinal and ethical purity. Um, you see this even in the New Testament. Let's look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 here. Um, but false prophets also arose among the people, 
just as there will be false, false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Right, so Paul or Peter here in First Peter is concerned about false teachers. We're concerned about false teachers today. What do we do? We have to evaluate what they're teaching, see where it deviates. That word heresy there means a deviation or a willful conscious choice to deviate from an established teaching. Right, that's what heresy is. And there's actually been some in, in the uh, academic world that, that try to say that heresy precedes orthodoxy. And in some places and at some times perhaps it did. But generally, and by and large, there is one true deposit of faith that Jesus Christ taught, that he passed on to his apostles, that they went out and passed on to faithful men and entrusted to faithful men generation after generation after generation. And that's how we all got here today. Each one of us could actually trace our spiritual heritage back to one of those 12 apostles, right? If we could trace everyone who taught the faith to them, uh, we could do that. So let's look at this first uh, heretic here, and feel free to stop me at any time if it does get a little too weird for you, and you, you need a little redirection. This first guy here, Marcion, he lived from 85 AD to 160 AD, so very early on. He got this really weird idea that the Bible doesn't talk about one God, but rather about two gods. And that the Old Testament God, the Creator God, wasn't the supreme God. He's actually a type of demigod, but he's evil, and he's responsible for evil. He created evil, and he's a bad God, but that the supreme father God is the God of the New Testament, and he's loving and nice and, and grace-filled. So you can see there's some problems with this teaching, right? This is Marcion. Two God theory here. A uh, little bit about Marcion, his life. Um, he was born in, around 85 AD. He was born to a wealthy ship, shipbuilder in Pontus on the Black Sea. So he comes from a lot of money, a lot of wealth, in uh, 139, he goes to Rome, and he gives the church at Rome a very large sum of money. I mean, just a, a whole lot of money, right? They're building a new building in Rome. And uh, in 144, he's deemed a heretic. The, the church realizes what he's teaching, and they, they uh, approach him about it, say, you can't do this, and he doesn't recant or anything. And they actually gave the money back. It's a pretty cool story. The church at Rome said, we don't take heretics' money here. Um, think about that. A business meeting here. Imagine that. A business meeting here. Someone gives a large amount of money. You go, man, these guys, this guy's not a believer. We're giving this money back. Not so easy. Polycarp, an early church father, calls uh, Marcion firstborn of Satan. Um, they did not think highly of him. Um, he was alive. He knew Justin Martyr was teaching in Rome about this time and, and read Justin's apology, um, we believe, and, uh, but still never came to the true faith. Some theology about him is recorded in uh, Tertullian's work, Another Church Father. Um, the Marcionite myth, there are two gods, God of the Old Testament, God of the New Testament. What I like to do, maybe this is where it gets weird. I think Marcion's favorite worship song would be, you're a good, good father. Um, he'd just have to add another chorus, you're a bad, bad creator, right? He would sing the song to two separate gods. I got at least one chuckle, I'll take it, all right. I'm not as funny as Garrett, that's okay. He believed the Old Testament God created all things and the rules and the law and and. Uh, and justice, and he was just an angry God who demand justice. But then there's a supreme God who had compassion on creatures, who sent his son uh, to ransom them from the wicked. Marcion loved to point to verses like Isaiah 45, 7, um, where God speaks to the prophet Isaiah and says the words, I create evil. And Marcion takes that and says, well, see, creator, creator God, evil, he created evil, he's an evil, wicked God. He'd read things like Luke 6, 43 through 45, says good tree bears good fruit, bad trees bear bad fruit. He'd say, look, clearly the Old Testament God bears bad fruit, the New Testament God bears good fruit. It's clear, the Bible teaches this, this is what he'd say. He'd look at uh, Galatians, and uh, where, or Acts rather, where, where Paul rebukes Peter, because Peter is a Jew living like a Gentile. And Paul says, what are you doing? You can't do this and then make people do this. And he'd say, see, 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 look, the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. We can unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. We don't need it. The Old Testament's the bad creator God. We don't have to live like it. In fact, Marcion created his own canon of scripture um, where he would uh, completely remove the Old Testament. He didn't like any of the gospels except for Luke, except he'd take the first few chapters of Luke out. Um, he only liked 10 of Paul's letters. He doesn't like any of the pastorals or Hebrews. 
Um, he arranges them in Galatians, Romans, First and Second Thessalonians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and that's his Bible. And he says, this is my Bible, this is all I need. I just need Paul's words here. And uh, he makes a very strong law-gospel distinction between the two, and uh, it's just radical. And so what we can see here, and this is the point that I think we need to learn from the early church, and you'll see this with each of these guys, they're using the Bible to teach falsehood. So the question becomes, how do we deal with false teachings that is using the Bible and using Christian language, but it's obviously something that is substantively different than the one true faith that was passed down once for all to believe? How, what, how do we examine that and determine something is substantively different? We're going to get there in a little bit. So that's Marcion. Any questions on Marcion? I think we see elements of Marcionism today, not, uh, not as strongly clearly, but I think anytime someone wants to say the Old Testament's irrelevant or that we don't need the Old Testament, um, uh, yeah, sure. So the Marcion, is it more like he's taken his personal interpretation of the Bible and just twisting it for his religion? Exactly, 100%, okay. yeah, nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah, he's got his own personal inter interpretation. He's got his own framework of understanding of who God is, right? Metaphysical beliefs, as well as what the Bible is. And it's substantively different. That's the language I want to continually use. It's substantively different than the, the faith once handed down for all. And uh, he views everything through that lens. And that's the problem, right? Great. So our second one here is Valentinus. Valentinus... Uh, has a, a view that's come to be known as Valentinianism, um, which is a form of Gnosticism, um, which is a, a larger group of views that all share some common, um, common teaching, common ancestry even, and there's quite a bit of debate today even if we can talk about Gnosticism as a whole group. I think we can. Other people think we can. Some people think we can't. So there's my disclaimer. Um, Valentinus was from Alexandria. He lived from 100 to 160. He taught in Rome and in Cyprus. He wrote many hymns and letters and works, but all of them are within a Gnostic worldview. Um, and I'm, I'm going to describe that for you here in just a little bit. Um, Gnosticism is a collection of early Christian heresies that all bear a family resemblance within a context of a dualistic worldview. One of the church fathers talked about Gnostic heresies as uh, mushrooms. He says you cut one down in the evening, and you go to bed, and you wake up, and there's eight more the next morning in the yard. That's how he describes Gnosticism. Uh, so Valentinianism is just one of these. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, that's where you see Paul talking about falsely called knowledge. It says, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irrelevant babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. So this is a, a, a it's a, a, almost like a cult, right? Um, so a uh, typical definition, this is from uh, an author by the name Mark Sheese is his last name. He wrote a book named Gnosis in which he argues that we can deal with these together. It's um, an, an explanation of the world in which the spiritual is utterly supreme to the physical where everything physical is evil and bad and wicked and everything spiritual is good and pure and blessed. And they imagine this, when we say the heavens, they would say the pleroma, which is all of the spiritual beings out there in which there's 30 different pairs of beings that uh, emanate from one another in descending order until you get to Sophia, which is wisdom in Greek. And Sophia violates... Uh, Bithos, here's a, a little bit of a picture. You can see th this is the worldview that they use. And each one of these aeons use Christian language like love and hope and faith and peace. And, it, and they come down to each other. And uh, Sophia violates um, Bithos's order to not create matter. And she creates matter out of, um, out of disobedience. And this is the, the Gnostic worldview. And they would teach that Jesus is one of these demigods that, that emanates from these other beings that redeems matter, but only in a spiritual sense because you can't really redeem matter. Um, anytime you hear language of a divine spark, that's Gnosticism 101. That, in fact, uh, any Office fans in here? The Office? Maybe? A few? 
So Rain Wilson is a Gnostic, a modern-day Gnostic through and through. I watched an interview with him just recently where he quoted, he said, um, and it's a, it's a beautiful quote. It's a, it's a wonderful thought, actually, until you examine it and realize, well, maybe that's not quite true. Um, he said, we're not uh, physical beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a physical experience. You go, wow, that's beautiful. Um, but, but what the Bible teaches is that well, we're actually body and mind and spirit three in one. And to place the spiritual over the physical is a Gnostic error, <laughs> is what it is. Um, and Rain Wilson actually uses the, the language in that interview. He says, uh, he says, we all have the divine spark within us. And I'm like, oh, wow, he's actually like, this is second century Gnosticism right here. And, um, and so you can see it's just absolutely kind of wild. Um, so they take Christian language, um, they take a little bit of Christian scripture, not, not too much, um, and they interpret it through their own Gnostic, um, Platonic, there's some Plato in there, um, framework of understanding. Let's go to the next one, and this may be a little more helpful. So, so let's see, yeah, so you can see it, right? This is the Ogdodad here, and the and the decad, and the dodecad, and it all emanates down to the bottom. Sophia's there at the bottom. This is how they would teach, right? And so these early church fathers are writing, going, that's not what the Bible teaches. You're using Christian language, but you're not following it. And they would emphasize uh, stark dualisms. Uh, several different here. These are in your notes if you want them. There's cosmological dualism, which is a separation of worlds. Between the spiritual world and the physical world, there's a stark divide. And you can't cross it. There's a theological divide. There's a separation between the gods. Um, each of those gods are separate. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. An anthropological separation in terms of those with or aware of the divine spark and those without. There's two classes of people in Gnosticism. If you have gnosis, which is simply knowledge of the divine spark, then you are uh, a Gnostic. You are chosen. You are whatever, saved, if you will, in their worldview. Christological separation, so because matter is evil, Jesus, the Jesus that they imagine, can't take on a physical body, not actually, not really, because that would make him mixed with evil or partly evil. So Jesus, the Christ, the Savior for Gnostics, is only spiritual, not physical. Um, and then and then soteriological, are like, by the way we're saved, um, is a stark separation of body and soul, that, that only the, the soul is pure. And so this Gnosticism raises questions about who God is and, and creation and what the heavens are, the person and work of Christ, the nature of salvation, who we are as people. And it completely, uh, it, it's a complete substantive difference. Right? I think we can see that. It's a substantive difference between the faith once handed down, delivered from the apostles on. Um, and this is what um, fathers like Irenaeus and Tertullian would write against Gnosticism. Um, any Questions on Valentinianism or Gnosticism? Thanks, Toby. It's wild. And when you start reading it and you go, man, they taught this. They believed this. Um, I think we still see evidences of Gnosticism, like I mentioned with, with um, Rain Wilson and others, that uh, a lot of, yeah, spiritualism or mysticism has Gnostic roots. Yeah. So somebody that... Uh speaks of the divine as, say, the universe, right? Yeah. Is, is that what you're talking about there? It's a form of it. It's a form of it. Um, it depends what they mean by universe, okay. right? Um, if they mean a spiritual force, then, yeah, that could be influenced by Gnosticism. If they mean uniform universe, like some people you say the universe as, like, all created and uncreated things, and, yeah. That's the universe, yeah, 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 the universe told me, or whatever, yeah, yeah, it, that absolutely could be, um, there, there's, I think there may be, like, a, a, a pantheism worldview that uses similar language, um, but there's certainly a, a Gnostic worldview as well that would do that as well. Um, one crazy thing, guys, you can go get a master's degree in Gnosticism right now from Rice University. You can go down to Rice and sign up, they've got a Gnostic faculty, like, three or four professors that have PhDs in Gnosticism, and uh, so th it's not dead. <laughs> it's still around. Uh, so that's Gnosticism. Uh, next we have Montanus. Montanus is fun. Uh, Montanus uh, lived from 135 to 177 in an area called Phrygia, 
and uh, sometimes I like to call what happened there the Phrygia Frenzy, um, because Montanus believed in new prophecy and uh, would prophesy uh, with uh, theatrics and in ecstasy and, and uh, just really wild. And he uh, partnered up with two women, Priscilla and Maximilla, and together they were called the three, and they would uh, provide new revelation for their followers. They didn't deny that the Bible was true. They didn't deny that the Bible was authoritative, that it was valuable, that it was necessary. Um, but their prophecies were equal to or superior to what the Bible had said. Um, they wrote at least 16 books of prophecy. We don't have any of them today, unfortunately. Um, Eusebius, 200 years later, tells a story about Montanus and, and what they did. Um, in 200 AD, Montanus, uh, after his death, Priscilla and Maximilla shift their focus away from prophecy and more towards ethical rigor and aestheticism, which is uh, strict denial of any earthly pleasures um, for a, a religious reason. Um, this is called, theological perspective here, they're called the new prophecy as added revelation to the prophets and the apostles. They claim the Holy Spirit gave them direct revelation. Uh, they believe he was... Uh, he was the incarnation of the Spirit. In fact, one of his quotes is, I am the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? If you're ever sitting in a church and the preacher says, I am the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, run. Right? <laughs> like, get out the back door as fast as you can. Um, but to defend his views, right? Like I said, guys, these false teachers are using the Bible to say this, to teach this. John 14, 26, but the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. The Bible says it. Matthew 23, 34, I'm sending you. Um, prophets and sages and teachers, right? Who quote the Bible and say, I'm the prophet that do this thing. Scary. He had a, an end times focus, an, ex, an eschatological focus, so he was, he was constantly prophesying that, you know, the end times was coming, and um, it's not necessarily wrong. I think we do need to, you know, consider <laughs> uh, that, uh, but he taught that it would be there in Phrygia as the place that the new Jerusalem would descend, um, one other it's, uh, interesting difference between Montanus and what I would call the Orthodox Church Fathers or our Church Fathers that, that we trust, <laughs> that, are, that are faithful, um, is that he would encourage martyrdom. He would encourage his followers to go and get martyred. Um, go poke the bear of Rome to, to die for your faith. Um, the Church Fathers would, would say, if martyrdom comes to your door, don't deny Christ. Don't give in. Don't lie. Tell the truth, honor Christ, and if martyrdom comes, it comes, and you praise God that, um, that that's your calling. They would not encourage you. None of the Orthodox Church Fathers would encourage you to go and, and poke the bear, if you will. None of them would tell them, go and, and go to a Roman centurion and tell them Christ is Lord and, and you know, whatever. Um, Montanus is different in that he would tell them to go and do it. Um, so, yeah, so his... Teachings raise questions about the nature, limits of divine revelation, the supreme authority of the scriptures. And uh, I think we see teaching like this all too often today still. Um, they, they may not claim <laughs> to be followers of Montanists, but um, I, think, I think we see this uh, quite often in some of our churches, unfortunately. Um, any questions on Montanists, Montanism, new prophecy? Are these Mormons interesting? Um, that's not even who I was thinking about when, when, I'm, when I was thinking about churches today that, that have teachings like this. It would be in that Joseph Smith created new scriptures that are equal to the Bible, new prophecy. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we have polygamy, you know, yeah, sure. Um, I don't think Montanus would be, would be for polygamy. Yeah, you did run around with a couple girls, that's true, but... Uh, but yeah, I don't think he would be for polygamy. He, he was very aesthetic. I mean, I don't even know if he was married. I, I bet he would, he would lean towards celibacy. Um, and and uh, actually, so, um, but yeah, in terms of adding to scripture, things like that, yeah, we do see some parallels there with, with, with Montanism. Okay, as we're talking about these people who take the books of the Bible and change them mm -hmm. and say that they're the prophet. Mm-hmm. How do we know that the books of the Bible that got put together, like, these prophets are real prophets? Because we're just question. taking their word for it. Great question. As well? Great question. Um, can we put a pin in that? 
So I'm going to conclude today. When we get through, we're going to get through one more, but it's kind of a, a, a bait and switch. It's, it's three and one more point. Um, and then after that, I'm going to get to how did the early church defend the faith? How did they, where, where did they and how did they draw the, the, the lines? Uh, I like to think of, of our Christian faith as a well. And Jesus drew the lines of the well and said the well doesn't get any wider. But over the first couple centuries, what happened was church fathers would dig that well deeper and understand what exactly the Bible teaches on these issues. Um, so these guys, Montanus and Valentinus and, and Marcion, were digging outside of the well. <laughs> they're, they're outside of the, the, the walls of the well trying to dig a new well. Yeah, add-ons, exactly, exactly. And the church says, no, you don't get to do that. Um, but we'll get to that. And I'm going to give you three things that we use to, to uh, maintain proper faith. Okay, so the last one here is Arianism. Uh, but to get to Arianism, I've got to give you a little bit of background on some um, other false views that developed over time. So we call these views monarchianism. Uh, monarchianism means one rule, right? Think of the monarchy, right? The British Empire, the monarchy, God save the queen, right? Um, trying to make connections for you here. So they believed so strongly um, versus, for example, Deuteronomy 6.4, that God is one, Right? God is one being. He cannot have multiple persons. There is only one God, period, end of story. And we believe that. We absolutely believe that as good Trinitarians. We believe God is one. But they took it beyond what that means. Um, and there's two types of monarchians. Uh, there's the adoptionistic or dynamic. It's two words there for you, meaning roughly the same thing, adoptionistic, dynamic. And then modalistic, or I'm going to give you a fun theology word here. You ready? Patripassionism, which is... Um, so, patri, father, is the term there. Passion. Why do we call it the passion of Christ at Easter week? Does anyone know? For suffering. For suffering. Passion can also mean intense suffering um, from the Latin. And, uh, and so, patri, passionism is the idea that the father is the one who suffered on the cross. That's modalism. So, let me teach you both of these real fast. Adoptionistic or dynamic, the first one of the monarchi monarchians is an uh, example of that is Paul of uh, Samsoda from 275, and basically what that is, is that uh, Jesus was a man who God uh, bestowed on him divineness at some point during his life. He adopted him into the Godhead. He's not inherently God. He hasn't always been God. That Jesus, the man, is adopted. That's what we call it adoptionistic or dynamic. Something changed. He went from man to Godhead. Does that make sense? That's heresy. We don't believe that, okay? The other one is... Uh, uh, modalistic or uh, patripassionism, uh, which is Praxius in 200 or Sibelius in 215. Um, this is modalism. It's the idea that God the Father existed from the beginning of time up into the incarnation. God the Father ceased to exist and instead became a different mode, became God the Son, Jesus Christ. Then after the ascension, well actually probably since Pentecost, God the Son ceased to exist and became a different mode, God the Spirit, right? So that if you're looking at a timeline, it's one God, three different modes. So I call it modalism. Theologians are, are so creative. Um, so um, that's clearly wrong as well. We see this still today. In fact, there's a movement called Oneness Pentecostalism um, that holds this very firmly. If you ever hear a song or any teaching that says the Father died on the cross, the Father suffered, um, I get up and run out the back door, I guess. Um, another way that we see it. I, I'm a little less firm on this, but I'll share it with you guys because we're all friends here. Um, when people say the Father ransomed us, be weary of that. Um, every evidence in the Bible of a divine person ransoming people, it's the Son that ransoms. Um, and I think this is a, a backdoor way that... Some oneness Pentecostals are trying to get, get uh, the idea that the Father ransomed. The, the Father, um, at least in Scripture, uh, we don't see the Father ransoming us. It's, it's the Son that paid the ransom. And I think it's important that we maintain um, the acts and works of the Trinity, of the persons within um, 
what they do and, and, and act out of. So um, just a few thoughts for you there. But these, these uh, false Christologies lead up to the great one, which is Arius um, and Arianism. Arius is a young presbyter in Alexandria, which means he's a young preacher. Um, by the time that this came about, there's bishops and there's presbyters underneath them. So the bishop is like the pastor of the whole city or region. The presbyters are like the, the me and Garrett's in the pulpit each week and, uh, and, and doing pastoral care and things. So he's a young guy. And his favorite saying was, there was a time when the sun was not. I mean, they sang songs. There was a time when the sun was not. There was a time because he didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the eternal son of God. Um, Jesus Christ was um, a created being. He would say that Jesus Christ was created before all other creation and that all of creation was created through. Right? He'd use those scriptures. <laughs> In fact, one of Aries' favorite verses is um, Colossians 1.15. He is the firstborn, right? What does that mean? How can he be firstborn and be uncreated? He loved John 3, 16. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. The Greek word there is monogenes. And frequently, monogenes meant created, right? It's, it's begotten, it's born. He'd also take the titles, father, son. Well, cl- clearly... Has there ever been a father that was a father, um, well, one without a son, but, but has they ever had a son at the same time that he was born? No. Just the, the, the logical reasoning of father and son, right? I'm not trying to convince you all to be Arians. I'm just telling you what, what Arius said. Um, the problem with this is, is the Bible and the historic teaching of the church, that Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God, that he holds all of the the, the rights, responsibilities, privileges, characteristics of God. And the chief characteristic of God is eternal, <laughs> uncreated. In fact, there's only two classifications of all beings that have ever existed. There's uh, creator and there's creation and nothing in between. So to say that something or someone is a created being is to say that they are not the creator, right? They're mutually exclusive. Um, and so that's, that's the problem that people like Alexander or Athanasius, who I'm working on, <laughs> I just spend a lot of time in Athanasius, um, they're saying, they would say to, to claim that Jesus isn't God, isn't fully God, is to say that he is unable to save us from our sins. That's what they would say. And uh, they had a, a big, big issue with that. And this led up to 325, the Nicene Council, which is known as the first ecumenical council. Um, Constantine's the emperor at this time. He has ruled that the Roman Empire is a Christian nation. And, um, and he sees that Arius and the Arians are causing such a problem that he's afraid that the church is going to get split over this. And so Constantine says, hey, let's get 250 to 300 of my favorite bishops together. And we'll gather together and we'll, we'll hammer this thing out and figure it out. One of my favorite stories from the Nicene Council is uh, one of the church fathers. Uh, his name is St. Nick. Has anyone heard of St. Nicholas? We go, this is Santa Claus, okay? Uh, St. Nick got so mad at the Council of Nicaea. He got so mad at hearing Arius sing this song, There Was a Time When the Sun Was Not, that he gets up and he slaps Arius across the face. And they got to kick him out of the council, and he gets censored because of it, and uh, it's, it's wild. So uh, this, this go, happens over a number of months, actually, several months um, that the Nicene Council is gathered, and they're, they're trying to come up with language that correctly reflects what the Bible teaches. That's what they're trying to get at the bottom of at Nicaea. What does the Bible teach about who Jesus Christ is? That's the question. And they ultimately determine, um, well, some key decisions here. Uh, this should be in the notes. I'm skipping a few lines here. Yeah, uh, the, the Nicene Creed, the key decisions of the council, they choose language like we believe. They're using language of recon- recognition. We recognize that this is what we have been taught and what the Bible teaches. They're not deciding the faith at Nicaea. They're going, we believe this. And ultimately, they believe that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all truly God. Right? This is where we get the language of one substance or one essence and three persons. Right? That they, they're all of the same exact, the, the word is homoousios, the same substance. They all possess that. They all have that. 
but they're three persons. Um, so the, the creed goes on to say uh, that Jesus Christ is begotten, not made. Right? They, they, they have to clarify. He's begotten, but that doesn't mean he's made. <laughs> it just means he's begotten. And so um, that's the Nicene Creed. And so that, that's how they ultimately decided Arius um, is um, exiled. He ends up in the Far East. And uh, actually, I think there is some, some Arian and Nestorius churches actually still in, in like India and the Far East um, to this day. But, um, yeah, so there's Arianism, another heresy there, um, using, using the Bible to, to teach what it shouldn't. Um, there has been some, some movements in recent scholarship in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. That's recent in, in scholarship. Uh, trying to defend Arius and try to make him um, just a misunderstood genius of some kind. Um, but he refused to, um, to recant. He, he refused to accept. He couldn't, he couldn't sign the, the Nicene Faith. He couldn't subscribe to it, um, and he wouldn't. And so um, I think that stubbornness probably qualifies as, um, as heretical, right? <laughs> and so... Um, any questions on all the way back to the Monarchians, to Arianism, to Nicaea? Any questions on, yeah? That's a great question. Um, yeah, that, that's what my, 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 my retort was going to be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's great, yeah. Um, the, the question was, why were people so enthralled with these false teachings? If, if there was a strong church and if they had grown up, uh, a lot of people didn't grow up. A, a lot of people, um, you know, these people, uh, or their teachings would go to rural areas. Um, this, that's the argument of Walter Bauer in, in Orthodoxy and Heresy, where he, he argued that heresy precedes orthodoxy. Um, and he looked specifically at a place called Edessa. And, uh, and he says, look, at Edessa, there were heretics there before there were orthodox Christians there. And, and so, yes, in some places at some times, her heresy may get there first, but that doesn't negate the fact that from the beginning, Jesus Christ taught orthodoxy first, and that heresy is a, is a, a willful choice to deviate from it. Um, I think in a lot of cases, these were very um, charismatic people, very charismatic leaders. They're personable. People liked them. They looked good. Um, and so I think that was a part of it. And, and yeah, I, I, that's what I would lean towards is... is yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm confused. Okay. <clears throat> what can I help you with? Father, Son, and Spirit are all truly God. Don't we think that? We do. Yeah, we are Nicene faith <laughs> believers. Yeah, we are Trinitarians. We are Nicene faith believers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm all better now. Yeah, perfect. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. I'm glad we can clear that up. I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So Nicene faith is uh, the, the one true faith. That's why we call it an ecumenical faith. Ecumenical means all different uh, uh, denominations or divisions all came together and came together and said, this is what we believe as Christians. Whether you're Greek Orthodox or Catholic or whatever, we all believe Trinitarian doctrine that God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are all one substance, one essence. They're all God. Um, and that's kind of the foundation. Interesting enough, in our Baptist history, there was a time and place um, where the non-Trinitarians won a vote. Um, oh, goodness, where was it? It was in New England in the 18th century, if I remember right. I might have to look that up. I'll send Garrett an email, and he can fill you all in. Uh, it's just, it's like the, one of the saddest, it's not Southern Baptist history. This is, this is predates Southern Baptist. It's other Baptists before, so, there were Baptists before Southern Baptists. Um, but yeah, so. Yes, perfect. We're getting to your part, by the way. I'm about to pull the pen out, and, okay. and we'll, we'll talk about it. I believe in the Father, Son, and Spirit, but I do have a question. Sure. So when Jesus was, being, was going through his trials and stuff, wasn't he calling out to God the Father? So mm -hmm. if he is God the Father. He is not God. The, God the Son is not God the Father. So he is a separate? This nope. is my confusion. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's so a great question. He's different, but he's not different. Exactly. They, exactly. You nailed it. Done. Okay. Welcome to Christianity. <laughs> yeah. So they are separate persons, yeah. <laughs> distinct in who they are, of one essence or one substance. No. 
It is him. You can't, you can't divide him. Distinct. Sure. 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 Why does he pray to him? Sure. Sure. Uh, several, several thoughts here. Um, that the church, the church has wrestled with this for thousands of years, by the way, and, and I think we've, we've settled on it, and I would encourage you to read some, some church history. Uh, Athanasius has a wonderful little text called On the Incarnation. It's beautiful, and uh, I read it every Christmas time, and it's, it's, really, it's really short. It's 100 pages, 120 pages. Um, so Jesus, we only say Jesus, God the Son, the Logos, the Word of God, John says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God. The Logos is eternally existent, right? What was he doing before the incarnation? He existed before. What was he doing before creation? He was existing. In fact, before anything was created, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, all existed in perfect harmony and community and fellowship together, completely self-sufficient. They had no need to create. They didn't have to create. They chose to create, and only they know, <laughs> right? So they created everything that's created, right? Man falls, Genesis chapter 2. The Trinity says, we're going to redeem him. How are we going to do it? God the Son is going to step out of heaven and become man. This is John 1, 14. The word became flesh, became flesh. He didn't change. He didn't cease being God the Son. He was always God the Son. He's still God the Son in the incarnation. But what we see in, in, in the incarnation, this is Athanasius' argument on the incarnation, what we see is that there's times, so it, it also gets to um, later, you have the uh, Constantinople Creed. So, so these questions of how Jesus is both fully God and fully man. The incarnate Jesus is both fully God and fully man at exactly the same time. 100% God, 100% man, unified but distinct, right? So there are times that we see in Jesus' ministry on earth in which he is you could say operating out of the human Jesus while without denying or losing sight of the divine Christ. Both are united in him. Does that make sense? So he's suffering as a man and yet supreme as God <laughs> at the same time. And how does that happen? I, I don't fully understand. I can't fully wrap my mind around it. Uh, exactly, exactly. So, But he has to be fully man. He has to be everything that we are to be able to save us, but he also has to be fully God in order to be a worthy sacrifice. He has to be both at the same time. Does that make sense? Um, so, then, so then you take that experience of Jesus incarnate and try to apply it to the Trinity. The Trinity is 100% Father, 100% Son, 100% Spirit, one substance, one being, three persons, all 100% God. Not a part or a division of them. Does that make sense a little bit? Okay. I know. It's, it's, uh, I think I have the Nicene Creed here. And uh, in, our, in, our, in your further readings in your church app, yeah, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, of the substance of God, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. Do you think they're trying to make a point there? God of God, very God of very God, light of light, right? How can you remove light from light? You can't. It's all light. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. Homoousios, that's the, the Greek word, one substance with the Father. By whom all things were made, by which in heaven and on earth, who for us, for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate and was made man. He suffered and on the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven and shall come again to judge both the quick and the dead. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. And that's where they ended that. Later on, there's a second, there's more creeds where they actually add on who the Holy Spirit is. And, uh, and then you get, you get an argument over uh, who he proceeds from, but. I think so. There are other denominations that do as well. I think Lutherans as well, um, per, perhaps. Um, all, I would say this, all true Christians can affirm Nicene Creed. They may not memorize it, but they can affirm it. <laughs> and, uh, and so, 
That's right. A lot of our Catholic friends memorize the Nicene Creed. They, re, they, they recite it every Sunday. At my church, uh, we recite it sometimes, not every week, um, but we do recite it sometimes, particularly when we have a baptism. I like to, I like to recite the creeds at baptism. And this actually le- leads into our next, our next section here. Um, early Christian, uh, let, let's get through this and, and, and we'll keep this conversation going. This is a great conversation, by the way. Early Christian identity, the way in which the church fathers protected the well that Jesus determined, made, taught, believed, confessed, um, the way they defended it is, is really around three different categories here. You have the creed, you have church life, and you have canon um, is, is what it develops around. And the first one is the creed, which is the rule of faith that details orthodox confessions. And as Baptists, um, I, I don't want to say historically, because the Baptists before the Southern Baptist, but the Baptists before the 19th century were creedal people. Um, they were confessional people. Um, you, you see something in the 19th and 20th century where Baptists begin saying things like, no creed but the Bible, um, which, which, which is in of itself a creed um, <laughs> of sorts, to say no creed but the Bible is a, a belief statement of sorts. Um, and and I, I think we're seeing a turn now where, where Baptists are, are, are kind of returning back to the creeds a little bit. And, and what, what the, the creeds in particular are, are historic ecumenical creeds. The Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, these historic faiths that we've always believed provide for us um, a theological narrative that aids in the interpretation of the Scriptures. How are we to properly interpret the Scriptures? Well, we believe, first off, that there is one God who exists in three persons. That helps us understand what it means when you get to Jesus saying, I, me and the Father are one. It helps us get to what it means when it says, I am the firstborn of creation. We have to start, um, uh, and I want to be careful, right, because I, I'm a good Bible first Baptist, right? There's no document, there's nothing that stands above or beyond the Bible. The Bible is supreme. But that creed comes right up underneath it, and insofar as the creed aligns with and teaches what the Bible teaches, it helps me understand how to interpret the Bible. And we're, in, we're living in a world today where it, it's, a, it's a post-truth world, it's a post-modern world, there is no truth, right? Anyone can interpret anything the way they want it. You want to hear a crazy interpretation I heard this week? Garrett, I'm sorry, forgive me, brother, this is, this is about to go off the rail. It's going to get weird. Um, I saw this person, this, this, I call this TikTok Christianity. Um, this, this, chick, this chick on, I'm not on TikTok, but I th- it was a video like that. Um, she said, God created non-genders. Look at Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created male and female. He created them. So this person was interpreting he created them not as male and female, but as a third gender them. How do we interpret this? So who's to say which interpretation is right? I'm saying my interpretation is right because it aligns with the historic faith of Christianity. And yours is outside of the well. Right? So they used the creed. They appealed to the creed. You had creeds very early on, I think, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul talks about um, Jesus Christ came and died according to the scriptures, more than 500 people saw him, that has a creedal formula to it. And that's written in 53, 54 AD. We're talking 20 years after Jesus' life, you have this, this, this creedal formula in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, I think people recited 1 Corinthians 15 at baptisms. I really do. It has that and I'm not the only one. I'm, 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 I'm drawing from a source on that. Um, you have the Apostles' Creed that we have written down, recorded for us as early as 150, 160. Um, but it's related to an older creed that we've come, come to know as the Old Roman symbol. Um, all very similar in the terms of, of being Trinitarian and affirming God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, three in one. Having that narrative of creation, fall, redemption, return aids us in properly understanding the Bible. The early church continually pointed to the rule of faith, closely tied to the content of Scripture as a guide for Christian identity. And any interpretation or any teaching that violated the historic faith, the creed, for us Baptists, I would say it's the Baptist Faith Message 2000. That's what we, is that what we all affirm here? Okay, good. I, I almost got in trouble. Um, but no, 2000, we're good. Um, yeah, that, that can function as a 
it's not a creed per se, but it, it functions as a confession for us to guide our interpretation to make sure that we are like-minded in one body. Um, so you have creed. The second development here is church life. Um, church life meaning what you see in the early church, you see the rise of pastoral leadership. Um, and, and even up to the, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, you see that in the 300s, 400s later on. Uh, once again, as a Baptist, I, I don't like the hierarchy, but I like the, the, the church leadership developing. You have strong pastors, you have church fathers writing and defending the faith. You also have a strong um, discipleship program, is what we could call it. Um, catechumen would come, which is a candidate for baptism would come, and they would um, take three years before they're baptized. Um, for, for several reasons. Before Constantine, you didn't want to baptize a spy, right? If the Roman government sent a spy in to find out if you're Christians because we're going to kill you all, um, you got to be pretty sure that this guy is not going to go narc on you um, after you baptize him, right? And so th for three years, they would teach him and train him. After Constantine, it's a little different, um, but they're examined for moral and spiritual purity as well as a proper understanding. Um, there's a strong process within the church of developing Christians and teaching them, um, but then also practicing the church, uh, church practices like baptism and Lord's Supper um, were, were incredibly important in the early church. There's several church manuals that you find in the second century. Um, the Didache is one that's my, one of my favorites. That means the teaching of the twelve. It's one of my favorite. Um, opens with there, there are two paths in, the, in life, one that leads to life and one that leads to death. It's a really cool um, church manual. They, they, they would preach. Um, Christ crucified, and um, they would read scripture like nobody's business. Most early church services, they're reading six, seven chapters of scripture, and then someone's preaching. Um, there's a funny story. I think it was Origen. I want to say Origen. Um, they read four or five, I'm telling you too many stories, we're going to get tired of it, but uh, four or five chapters are read, and Origen walks in with no sermon prepared, no notes, and goes, out of those readings you heard today, which one do you want me to preach on? And the people said, the witch at Endor which is a story of Saul in 1 Samuel. and uh, Because if you have an option, you're going to choose the witch at Endor, right? And so he just spontaneously preached a sermon on the witch at Endor, and it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so um, all that to say, church life was, was extremely important in developing Christian identity and protecting the true faith. Um, and that's one of the points against each of these heretics from the early church, right? They're not, they're not lining up with every other church's practices, they're doing their own thing. They're teaching their own thing. They're using different scripture. They're doing different stuff. They're not in line with proper church organization and structure. And then finally is canonicity. And this is your question. So we're going to end with your question. I'm, I'm, we're, we're going back to the pen that we dropped earlier. During this time, second, first, second, third century, you have the canon of scripture being solidified. And what you have is a collection of documents spreading around the ancient world, going between the churches, and they're asking the questions, they're actually categorizing uh, these, these letters and these books in three different categories. You have accepted scriptures, those that are generally accepted as inspired scripture. You have some questioned scriptures, those that uh, they may be authentic, they may not be, we don't really know. Some people read it over here, some people read them over there, but not everyone's reading them. And then you have rejected scriptures, those that are clearly, clearly uh, forged. They clearly teach against Christianity. They clearly don't fit in with the rest. And so you have different uh, categories being developed. And the questions that the early church is asking, um, uh, particularly as pastors in churches, when they get ready to read scripture, they're looking at these letters going, what are we going to read today? They're looking for three things. They're looking for um, uh, authorship. Is the book attributed to an apostle with direct revelation from the Lord? Is it written by one of those 12 apostles? Is it written by Paul? That's the question. Do we know for sure it's written by one of them? Uh, they're looking for belief or Catholicity. Does, is, is, the, is the book uh, universally viewed as sacred scripture? That's the question. Is this book scripture? They're not asking, do I like this book? Do I not like this book? They're saying, is this inspired scripture in the same way that the Old Testament prophets were inspired? That's the question as they're looking at these books. And third, uh, orthodoxy. Are these books theologically consistent with other inspired books? Is there, is there a theological acceptance? So they're looking at authorship, they're looking at acceptance, and they're looking at um, belief or theological belief. 
And that's what they're, they're, they're gathering them and asking these questions and, and using these things and rejecting some and accepting some. And what you have as early as 170, we have a fragment now called the Moratorian Fragment. And in it, every New Testament book that we have except for four are on the list in 170. John didn't finish writing his revelation until like 100. <laughs> We're talking 50, 60 years. We got a list. But not only that, the Mortorian fragment also lists some other books. See, he lists the Shepherd of Hermas. He says, man, this is a really good, he does, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, this is a really good book. It's useful for you to read, but don't read it in the public gathering place because we don't know the author. Right? He says he has some other books. He says, um, he, says uh, he mentions two other false gospels. He said, don't, he says, completely reject these because we know that a Gnostic wrote them. Don't read them. As early as 170, we have that list. It solidifies very quickly, and then you get at Nicaea, you get the official church council action where they do, um, so after they take care of Arius and that issue, they're like, what other issues are we having problems with? Like, oh, let's, let's solidify a canon list. And even then, they're not asking, they're not going through and going, oh, we don't like that one, we like this one, we don't like this one. They're going, which of these books did the Holy Spirit obviously inspire? That's what they're asking. And they go, well, all of us read these. All right, sounds good to me, <laughs> Right? Um, and, and by 325, they're just affirming what had already been practiced uh, for at least 100 years, if not longer. You've got Origins list in 230. You've got Eusebius's list in 325. Um, Athanasius has a list um, in 367, Council of Carthage in 397. Um, from 325 on, they're, they're all exactly the same, um, the same 66 books um, of the Bible. So um, the other thing is, if you're questioning, I, I, if you're questioning, these other books, I'd encourage you to go read the other books. So one of my favorite activities is I read the Gospel of Thomas with people. Um, the Gospel of Thomas is, is, the, is the tip of the spear of the argument that we got the wrong books in the Bible. Um, it, I mean, just everyone loves, all the, the non-Christians love to, to put up the Gospel of Thomas. Elaine Pagels is one. Uh, she actually has a, anyway. Um, I think she's a modern day. I think she, like, does devotional readings in Gnostic texts, Elaine Pagels. But, um, when you read the Gospel of Thomas, you realize it's not like any other gospel. Our gospels are theological biographies. They have context and places and people, and they have morning and they have evening, and it's told like a story. It flows like a story from, from birth to death and resurrection for our gospels, of course. The Gospel of Thomas is a collection of secret sayings that Jesus only told Thomas, allegedly. It's, it's, a, it's one-liners by Jesus. It's just little one-liners. One of my favorites Blessed is the lion who eats the man, for in eating the man, he becomes a man and is blessed. The very last verse of the Gospel of Thomas, um, blessed is the woman who becomes a man, for only men can be saved. So yeah, you read, you read Thomas, and you go, that's clearly not like Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, <laughs> right? You know, that clearly doesn't fit in here. So the early church is looking at these going, okay. One of these is not like the others. <laughs> Let's reject that. That's not inspired. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so there's, there's uh, scholars love to compile things. Um, Bart Ehrman has a, a, a published work called uh, Forgotten Books or Lost Books, something like that. Sure. I mean, I have, it's on my bookshelf. I have it. I've, I've read through a lot of them. Um, so uh, there's collections of Nag Hammadi texts. Uh, so in... I don't want to lie to you. In nine, 1945, um, they found the Nag Hammadi Library, which is a collection of, of scrolls, ancient scrolls from the second century, a whole bunch of Gnostic texts. So there's a, there's a collection of Gnostics that, that compiled all these Gnostic texts, kept the library. We found it in 1945, and you can find those texts uh, printed and published today, um, translated into English. That's why Rice University has a Gnostic program. Um, and so... Yeah, you can find it, you can read them, you can look at them, and you can go, this just doesn't fit. This just isn't, it isn't, there's a, the, the language I've been using, there's a substantive difference. And I get to make that determination, <laughs> right? Because I'm the interpreter. I'm the one reading the books. Um, you can read the books and make a determination on your own. You know, anyone can read the books. But when all of the church gathers together and says, man, we've read these things, and that's substantially different than what we are, there's validity in that. And that, that's what the early church used um, to protect. So you've got, You've got creed, the confession, the, the, what we believe. You've got church life, and you've got canon. And, and I would encourage anyone today, when you find a, a teaching that, that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, 
appeal to one of those three things. Run through, the, run, run through the test. Does this line up with the creed? Is this what we've always been taught? Is this what the Baptist faith message says? Is this what the Apostles' Creed says? The Nicene faith, the Nicene creed, is that, is that it? Go to the church life. Go to pastor. <laughs> Say, pastor, I heard this. Make a little hair stand up. What do you think? Right? Go to your small group. Hey, guys, I read this. What do you think? And then lastly, go to the Bible. <laughs> Read the Bible. Um, and, and, and allow the Bible to, to interpret itself. In fact, that's one of the lines in the Baptist faith message is that the Bible interprets the Bible. Scripture interprets Scripture. Um, so, any questions on the guardrails and protections? Awesome. Thank you. You guys have been great. This has been a good discussion. Uh, I, I introduced Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me close us in a word of prayer, and uh, I'll be here for a while. I, I have nowhere to be except home, but, uh, <laughs> but I could be here as long as anyone wants to talk. So, uh, God, we thank you so much for um, the faith once handed down. God, we thank you that you have preserved your word and you've preser preserved the true faith. By the power of your spirit, God, it's incredible. Um, it's incredible, and we're, we're, we're thoroughly grateful, God, that you've reached out and saved us. And as the Nicene Creed says, God, that you sent your son from heaven to earth to live the life we couldn't live and die the death that we deserved, and more than that, rise again in power. Um, and you did that for us in our salvation. It's indescribable, Lord. Um, we just thank you. Um, God, I pray that you help us to teach truth, to love truth, to confess truth, um, and protect us from any wrong thinking or wrong truth. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. Thank you for my new friends here. Uh, be with them as we go our separate ways. Lord, draw them back together on Sunday as a church family where you, you just be honored and glorified in all we do. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.